Thank you. So, a little bit about JBA. We're the largest flood mapping consultancy in the UK, and probably in Europe, and we're the only consultant that actually works on the frameworks for all the government agencies in the UK. When I worked at Aviva, I was tasked with actually building a flood map for insurance. And Aviva saw flooding as just from rivers. And in the five years it took me to build that map, I I'd started to understand a little bit more about flooding. And the fact that there was surface water, coastal, groundwater, dam failure, canal breaches, and all sorts of other types of flooding that actually affect properties. And if you're a customer, you don't really care where the water's coming from. For you, it's a big issue. So when I left Aviva and joined JBA, what we were trying to do was build a comprehensive flood map that actually looked at all types of flooding. And in the five years since we started, we now have 70% of both the insurance and property markets. So a fairly good start. What's really important with flood mapping is that methodology changes rapidly. So updating annually is actually a really important thing. This year is our fifth issue. It's literally just gone out. We cover six flood perils and for the whole of the UK. Plus we've now extended into Europe, so we have most of Europe. We also have Thailand and Asia. So a global flood map's on the way. It also has to be technically advanced. We use high resolution 2D modelling throughout. And if I tell you we have something like 17,000 graphical processing units to do a flood map, they're big serious computers. Luckily I don't have to do that work. And everything's modelled at a 5 metre by 5 metre scale, so it's pretty detailed and goes down to full property level. I'm only going to really talk about the three main flood types surface water, river and coastal. But just to give you a flavour of how we do the modelling, with surface water, obviously you get far more rain in the West Country than you do in East Anglia. So we have to take that into account when we're modelling. And because of the actual computation power, if you're modelling a 5 metre by 5 metre square, we have to split the country down because there's, in a 5 kilometre by 5 kilometre area, we do about 144 billion calculations for one surface water area. So it's pretty intensive. What we have is we model both a one hour and a 10 hour storm. What we found is that a one hour storm is most likely to cause flooding in steep areas, whereas something like a 10 hour storm, well, that's the sort of thing that caused Hull in 2007. And it's much lighter rain, but it just keeps going. So we model both of those for all areas and then we look for what's the worst flooding. And this view of Leeds is a fairly typical one. What you're actually seeing is surface water is water that runs across the land and tries to get into a drainage system or a river as most people call them. And that's what you're seeing there, that's the river. But surface water will run along anything that's low lying. So what you're seeing up here are two roads where the water's running along because they're more low-lying than the properties around them. But what insurers have been particularly interested in are these little holes. And they might be 20 or 30 properties in an estate of a 1,000 that have a particular risk. And being able to identify that is really what is key to surface water modelling. And Leeds is pretty typical. You're, you're seeing somewhere between... Two and six percent of properties have some impact from surface water. And those properties in those little dumps, they have nothing to do with where the river is. So they're off the river plain. And so when you look at something like the Environment Agency data, it won't even cover those because the Environment Agency are looking at rivers and coastal. With river modelling, that's far more well established. Practically every flood mapping company will do river modelling. What we have is a height map, and what you're looking at is cross-sections along where the river runs. And effectively we have a volume of water at a point, we let it go, and it runs down the river. We move 400 metres, we get another volume of water, let that run, and then we join it, pull the cross-sections. 
and that gives us both an extent and a depth of flooding in the rivers. <coughs> so going back to Leeds, you're now seeing both the surface water and the river. The river's the blue, and you can see it does very well tie in with where we're, we're saying the drains for the surface water was. We've modelled river undefended, and we actually provide an area of protection because for most people, most of the insurance clients that, that I work with, what they want to do is decide themselves how they use that information. With coastal, coastal is really break, broken up into three different elements. You've got the astronomical tide, which is just the rise and the fall according to the moon. Storm surge, which is about wind and pressure. And then you've got wave overtopping. We've taken, you have to model each element separately and then put them back together. And what insurance companies are very worried about is what you're seeing happening here, which is what effectively happened in 1953, a storm surge down the east coast causing a lot of flooding. What insurance, what insurance companies are very stupid about is it could equally happen there or there. And they've only bothered about the East Coast because the East Coast has happened. And I think that's one of the problems with flood mapping. People worry about what's already happened. They forget what could happen. And it really is a balance of knowing, you know, you can't just look at the past. You've got to think of what's possible going forward. <coughs> so that's a fairly typical example of coastal modelling. Again, that's undefended as though the um, defences had failed in Hull. It's not quite what happened in 2007, but potentially it could have done. Now, what's the problem with insurance at the moment? Is up to now, from 2001, they've had a statement of principles in place. That statement said, if you were protected to a 1 in 75 standard or better, you could get insurance. That comes to an end next year, and a lot of insurance companies have actually started withdrawing from the market now because they, <coughs> they don't want to take anybody on that's going to be a risk going forward. And naturally the government are having a hand in this. There are three options. The industry can go to the reinsurance market for a solution. They can pool the risk, so that means everybody pays something towards the risk. Or we can move to an open market. Now, pooling the risk and going to reinsurance is probably the best option, so naturally that's not the one anybody's looking at. The ABI, who sort of the Association of British Insurers, they, they actually prefer the pooling option where everybody, so it doesn't matter that you don't live anywhere that floods, you're going to be paying a premium towards the people who choose to live by rivers and are surprised that they flood. The open market is probably the insurance company's preferred option, but they don't say so. And the government have to actually really act as the insurer of last resort, and they're not very willing to do that. So it's a bit of a mess. The fact they got rid of Caroline Spellman hasn't helped. So I, I can actually see that June is going to be, it might sound a long way away, but the, web, the speed that government works and the insurance industry works it's pretty close, and I think it's going to be a problem. So from your point of view, what does that mean? For homeowners, it really is vital that they understand their flood insurance risk. Insurance is going to become expensive or unavailable, and their mortgages depend on it. Plus, flooding is really a horrible experience. If you've ever been into a house where there's sewage just siphoned up the walls in every room, even upstairs, you really wouldn't want to spend your time there. And it takes months to actually get everything back in order. Flood debt is now reasonably available and very affordable. And there's much more information. But what one might make available is the sort of the first step, and it's a really a way of choosing whether you need more information or not. But for businesses, it's absolutely crucial. A lot of searches are done on address points, whereas businesses are in fact much bigger. 
you know, medium and large enterprises, insurers expect to actually have done something to be proactive in managing their risk, whether that's mitigating it or protecting themselves against it. And the biggest problem with insurance is business interruption. Even if you're not flooded, if the flood stops you getting your supplies or cuts off your electricity, that's going to have a big impact on your business. And most businesses don't recover after a flood incident. Over 60% fail within two years, mostly because they're underinsured and they don't have a continuity plan. So this is a fairly typical example of an area. So if we took this building, if you were looking at a dress point, the point's fine. <coughs> However, there is flooding around the building, so you really do need to look at the area. Also, that particular building, the road's cut off. Possibly the substation is actually there, so maybe they have no electricity. If they happen to be a refrigeration plant, they're in trouble. And business interruption is often going to cost more for an insurer than the actual building being uh, renovated. Little buildings are fine, so small shops aren't a big problem. But if you look at warehouses, you really do need to have a look at the area and consider more than just the building that you're insuring. I promise I will finish quickly. Uh, these are just some validation shots from flooding that's happened in the last couple of years. So the pictures are, are taken from social media. And the mapping is JBA's. So you can just see so the public tally bonds, perfect example. Riverside caravan parks. Caravan parks notoriously flood. And uh, Morrison's got it wrong in Aberystwyth. <laughs> Thank you. Very quick. <laughs> Second question.